Me, my name is BJ Wooden. I'm also known as Cymatic Bruce on the interwebs. Uh, I run a YouTube channel and write articles and uh, various things about VR. I've been called a VR evangelist and I wear the title proudly. Um, it is a pleasure to be a part of this community and to be the MC today. Uh, we have some exciting things lined up from Make VR, from Tactical Haptics, um, and other various projects that are in the works our folks will be talking to you about. So I'm very much looking forward to sharing that with you. Uh, we're actually gonna start ourselves off with our main organizer and fearless leader, uh, Carl Krentz. Uh, come on up, Carl. All right. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much for coming. This is, uh, you know, we're bigger, we're better, we're back. We're going to keep doing this every month. Like I said last time, I wasn't kidding. We're going <laughs> to keep growing this thing. So this is really exciting to see so many people so excited about technology. And uh, yeah, we're in an exciting time, so more exciting things. So um, I want to thank um, Six Sense for uh, coming out in full force again. Um, Six Sense put out an announcement today, which is very exciting for anyone in this space. And they're gonna talk about that. They're gonna do a uh, customer feedback panel. So we can, uh, this is our chance. That's one of the things I wanted to do with this event is to get our, get our thoughts and ideas and opinions back to people that are uh, building this equipment and the startups and the businesses. And so this is our chance to have some input into the next generation products. So, so thanks Six Sense for stepping up. Nice. And also to uh, Philip Rosedale, who came, um, who is the creator of Second Life, if you don't know, which is really the closest thing we have to a metaverse right now, <laughs> one of my personal heroes, and he agreed at the last minute to uh, speak. So thank you, Philip, for coming, and we'll see you in a minute. And so with that, uh, let's kick it off. Uh, Bruce is going to say a few more words. Um, yes. Give. Uh, Get us started, and then Philip will come up, and then we have uh, Will from Tactical Haptics, and the Sixth Sense panel, and then we will break and transform, pull some of the chairs out, and have just our open demo time, show and tell, like we like to do it. So, all right, so thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> awesome, all right. Uh, I just wanted to take a couple minutes to kind of talk about what I know, uh, which is informal education. Um, as probably some of you have noticed, there haven't been many videos that have been out because I have now been uh, at the Tech Museum and uh, running the summer camps there. And we run all types of programs, computer programming, mobile web uh, design, web design, uh, a lot of fun stuff, Lego robotics. And we see from fourth to eighth graders really dive into some things uh, creatively. It's, uh, it's structured, but it's also a very uh, poignant focus on innovation and risk taking um, and embracing failure. Uh, and one of the things that excites me most about VR is its potential in the education space. Uh, Six Sense is doing some things that are very exciting with Make VR, which is basically uh, a way to make 3D design AutoCAD. Uh, something intuitive, as if you were using Legos or Play-Doh, uh, to bring that in the VR space with the Razer Hydra, and if you're in VR with the Rift or an awesome product like it, um, then you are making that a particular type of trade that you can teach to a kid in maybe the space of a few hours rather than weeks or months, uh, which is very, very exciting stuff. Uh, also, very exciting potential for that uh, is the ability to be virtually anywhere. Uh, one of the things I hear from a lot of people in their college years is that, oh, I got into physics, or oh, I got into engineering because there was this awesome high school teacher, or there was this awesome elementary school teacher that really got me involved and made science come alive for me and really got that spark of innovation for me. Uh, now with VR, we have the possibility to have that greatest teacher that everyone loves to be accessible to a lot more people at once. Uh, not only can that virtual person, you can get in the virtual classroom uh, and get a lecture from that virtual person, but that virtual person is always looking at you as well, uh, which is really cool. I mean, um, one of the things about uh, education in a classroom setting is that the people in the front normally learn better 
because normally I'm looking at those people in the front and I'm interacting and you're making eye contact and you're like, yeah, yeah, I know what that guy's talking about, great. And the people in the back are like, oh, whatever, uh, hmm, Nintendo DS, great, oh, whatever. Um, and the learning doesn't happen the same. In a virtual space, you can have eye contact uh, with every student simultaneously, <laughs> which is a fascinating concept to be able to think about, uh, where public speaking and education takes on a whole, uh, a whole nother, uh, you know, kind of a medium uh, and really gets very, very exciting. So that's one of the things I'm hoping to see a lot more of um, and that I'm going to be looking to forward personally uh, and look at. So I just wanted to kind of share that information with you about that excitement, about uh, how we can tap into the, the freedom and the creativity that children uh, express uh, and that intuitive interfaces uh, that we can use and really unlock uh, some of that, some of that creative juice that those uh, that those kids have, which is really cool. So, awesome. Uh, that's why I had to share for today. So I'm just going to move it right along. Uh, next on our agenda here is, hold on, <laughs> Philip is going to come on up, uh, creator of Second Life, and he's going to be talking about uh, some new stuff that he's working on. So let's welcome Philip to the stage. Thanks, Carl. Thanks, you guys. Um, this is great. I, well, I've been, uh, yeah, VR and the, the dream of, of building virtual spaces has been what I uh, have pretty much worked on my whole life now. And, uh, from the time I was programming as a kid, was what I was always thinking about. And in fact, when I came to San Francisco in 95, I remember I was, I don't know how many people, I bet, I bet people here, some people here were at that meeting. There was, there was like a VR meetup that was in the Exploratorium. This, is, this was uh, when Linda uh, Stone from Microsoft was, was running it. And it was, I was like in the back and it was 95. And, you know, you can imagine like how primitive the technology was back then. But I was like in the back of the room and taking notes and thinking like, oh, we got, yeah, we got to make this stuff work. And uh, it's amazing to, to think, you know, what a, what a ways it's been and how, I mean, it is all actually starting to work now, but I was dreaming about this stuff since I was a kid. I, you know, I, uh, I didn't start Second Life. I didn't try to start Second Life until 1999, which is like, I, I look at all this hardware, all this technology uh, in explaining like why I started working on High Fidelity, which is this new, a new company. Uh, in, in 99, there were really like two sea change events that drove me to create Second Life. I had the idea that we could create a place that, that you know, that was a general, interesting, open, you know, uh, buildable virtual reality. And the, the two things were uh, broadband, because I was at Real Networks at the time. My buddy Brad, who, who works with, with me at High Fidelity, was also, we were at Real Networks together. We. Uh, in 99, you could see that broadband was going to be the only way people connected to the net. Uh, so that was one sea change that had happened. It was only at like 7 or 8 percent penetration, but we knew the curve went to 100 very quickly once it had gotten to close to 10 in the metro areas. And so we were like, I was like, OK, we got, we got all this bandwidth now, all being like 200 kilobits per second was what I felt like. But I was like, 200 kilobits per second, the world was mine. And then nice. the second thing that happened was uh, NVIDIA, everybody probably remembers, NVIDIA released the GeForce 2. Which was like the first, you know, you could talk to with OpenGL, it was a graphics coprocessor, it was pretty fast, two million triangles per second or whatever they said at the time. And I got one and I started doing some OpenGL programming on it and I looked at it, you know, I made some water and I looked at it and I said, we can do this. So, so that, that's, that, those two things were the things that drove me to start Second Life. Uh, we just started working on my new company, it's highfidelity.io. Um, and it's a totally new virtual world. It's, it's completely rewriting and beginning again and trying to build a, a well, hopefully spectacularly different uh, and improved uh, version of a, a full-on open global virtual world. The two things that drove us uh, to, to get started with the project in a similar fashion, uh, one was I took, uh, I got a gyro chip uh, the very same, uh, the very same uh, chipset that I, I think is in the Oculus and is in just about you know every device we've got out there now is an analog uh, IDG and Vensense gyro, and I hooked it up to a pair of glasses. There's a picture of this on our website, and I put it on and I made a little dummy avatar of myself and I just started like moving back and forth and nodding my head 
and moving and, and we all put this thing on and tried it. Five milliseconds or so of delay like the Oculus from the, from the card to the serial port and then you know 60 frames per second rendering, so 20 milliseconds or something worst case delay. The, the of how my head mirrored myself, the sort of neurological effect of seeing like that movement on the screen, so perfect. Nothing, I mean, even the webcam putting glasses and a hat on you, this is different because at 60 frames per second, your brain sort of believes it and attaches to that mirror representation in a way that's, that's really amazing. And I, I did that and looked at it and was like, yeah, we gotta, we gotta start another company. You know, that was, that was one of the, the and then the second one was that kind of along with the proliferation of all these amazing hardware devices that are so buildable now. I mean, we can make anything with hardware, not to mention all this amazing VR hardware. We can make just about anything now. Uh, we were watching this immense proliferation of devices, and I started thinking about, well, if we're going to build a new virtual world, how are we going to build the, the, the network that goes... Uh, the, the network of machines that actually creates the virtual space. And I started thinking, well, you know, when we started Second Life, we had to have rack-mounted servers that we actually bought ourselves. There's 40,000 cores that run Second Life today. Back then, I mean, the first few thousand cores were an unthinkable adventure. We thought we were so cool that we could just buy these pizza box machines and install them and light them up, and we was, it was awesome. We'd drop ship, you know, crates of them. And, and then EC2 came, and now it's like we don't even, you know, we don't even, we don't even know where our servers are. We don't even care. It's wonderful. But I started, we started thinking about that, and we thought, well, if you look at Second Life and you look at this community, this, 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 you know, this, this feeling that you get around virtual worlds where you're all kind of building it together and in it together. We started thinking, well, wait a second, with all these devices coming out, like, what does everybody have that they can give? And it's like an extra computer in their den, right? Or what about, how, what about the fact that you only use a virtual world for an hour a day, but you sleep for like eight hours, during which time, if we had the right software written, which we're writing, we might be able to use your, your iPhone or your iPad or your laptop or your desktop in the den as part of the simulation grid. So the big, so what we're working on is technology at high fidelity that is different than, say, with like Second Life, that is, that is we, we hope is, is distinct and new and, and powerful along two axes. One is this use of, uh, and it's a little different than what you think of with the Oculus, although we have an Oculus and we have it hooked up to our prototype world and it's, it's mind-bogglingly cool. But the thing that we got excited about was not so much using sensors and interface devices to like look around or manipulate the world, that's an important piece of it. But the other piece we started thinking about was that thing that I got so excited about when I saw my head mirrored on the screen, which was if I can feel that way, if I can look into somebody's eyes, Bruce, you were talking about looking into everybody's eyes. I thought like if I can look into your eyes and you can feel me, whatever that means, right? It's not, we're not, when we're face to face, we're not smelling each other. I mean, we are, but that's not, that's not what's driving the depth of the experience, right? There's something that happens when you look at somebody, when you're sitting across from somebody, there's something that happens. And the thing that we were excited about was, if we've got enough sensors and we can deploy a little bit of hardware, we've got to be able to get that across the wire. We've got to be able to like, make that one-to-one -one sense of presence or that teacher-to-student sense of presence actually happen online. So that's the first thing is, so what we're building is a bunch of stuff to enable that using these devices. Like that's the thing we're excited about. And then the second thing, as I said, is, is to build somehow a system in which perhaps the majority or all of the servers aside from simply being decentralized and distributed are actually running on machines at home in, 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 and using idle resources because uh, Second Life has, I said, 40,000 cores and typically 100,000 people online. So you've got less machines than you do people that are being serviced by those machines, basically. What if we could use your extra machines while you were asleep? If you do the math on that, I think we could have 10 times as many machines as people. So it's something like, it could be as much as a two order of magnitude change in the amount of machine power that we have. So uh, that's what we're working on at, at, in a nutshell uh, at High Fidelity. Uh, so we're, we're, uh, we started working on it in earnest. We're 10 people right now. Um, we started working on this earnestly uh, up in our office in San Francisco at the beginning of the year. Um, we've actually gotten a fair amount done, uh, although we're by no means ready to really even demo cool stuff, but uh, if you're a developer and you want to see what we've done, 
uh, or you want to kind of jump in and play with these ideas a little more or even come and bother us in our little private workspace in there. If you look at the bottom of our website, well, there's a blog with some videos, that, that head behavior thing. If you've not seen that, there's a little video up there of us doing that. Um, if you go to the bottom of the site, there's a GitHub link, which is actually the working code that we're working on right now. Part of our big belief about this is the future of virtual reality, given that it's got a scale from a million, a few million people using it to a billion people using it, I am totally convinced, we are totally convinced that that's got to be an open system where the, the code, the machines, the deployment, everything is completely open in the same way Apache is. It, it, it's got to just be a very, very simple, flat uh, system of some kind that everybody can just grab a copy of off of a, a repo and deploy on their own. I think there are ways we as a company can coordinate all that activity in a way that's useful and you know good for us as a company, but the, the direction we're going is that of a completely open system and therefore, in fact, the code that we're working on right now, you can go to the bottom of our site and, and, and download it, build it, and fire it up and actually walk in world with us. So for, for, for people that are developers here or real enthusiasts in this, feel free to do that. Nobody knows about this stuff yet, but this is the kind of gang you know, that would I, I don't know, hopefully embrace that. So come and give us uh, your thoughts about what we're building or check it out. Um, we also have this unique asset we built that's called the work list, which is an interesting kind of experimenter's tool in general. It's a way of uh, farming out like uh, contract sort of jobs, but in a very different way. You have to kind of see it to believe it. It's, it's kind of a big open code base and a chat room and a sort of a bid ask system where very high trust where we have a network of people that are helping us outside of the 10 of us that are working in San Francisco actually working on the code itself. So uh, that's a good overview. Uh, I don't know if anybody has like a question or two or do you want to? Or, or? Well, uh, does the, uh, I have a question, yeah, <laughs> does the, uh, the demo code you have, does, does that actually work with the Rift or any sort of any Yeah, display? the demo like, code we have, if you have a Rift, uh, you, you probably want to email me, oh, God, I can't, we've never seen, nobody's used to that side of the office, but uh, uh, the demo code we have on GitHub is cross-platform, uh, uh, well, no, it's, uh, it's Mac and Linux, I don't know if we have a working Windows build right now, it works with the Oculus, uh, on our machines at the office, so it, 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 it could, in theory, work for you. Um, we're like in total pre-alpha mode, so this is just like you're just looking at the code at this point. Uh, but it, it does work with the Oculus. Uh, what else does it work with, Brad? Am I missing any other hardware that we have? We've got this own gyro hardware we developed, and then we're all oh, we're also yes we're also working right now on on on, on adding the leap as well, so that we can we can play with that. Hello. Oh, are we recording? That's what we're doing. You're recording me. <laughs> They're recording me. Yes, Eric. Uh, so for someone who like, is a developer uh, or knows our program, like, can, so I'm a game designer, so if I can use something like you, can I think of this as an like, uh, image like you or you can? Long term, I think you can totally, right. I mean, well, I think in a way that's more generalized than Second Life, yes, the answer to that will be, Yes, and more so than Second Life, uh, but I would say, you know, like, hardly at this point. I mean, we're doing a lot of things that are radically different, you'll see, in how we would deploy this. 3D audio, we're using a sparse voxel oct tree, for those of you who know what that is, as kind of the organizing data structure for the, for the universe itself, stuff like that. How many people are developers here? I'm just curious. Cool, a lot, awesome. Okay, one more, I don't want to take too much time. For Can you talk about your development environment for uh, uh, yeah, codes on GitHub. Uh, uh, codes on GitHub. It's Xcode, uh, C++. Hardware. Hardware. Uh, uh, Not Windows, right? So. No, no, no. It's it's Mac. We're d we're doing our development in C++ on OpenGL. It compiles right now on 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 the Macs uh, and on Linux. It's Don't be afraid. We're not saying we're just not doing Windows because we don't have any Windows boxes in our 
Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We're not like religiously opposed to Windows. We're ju we're just we just literally don't have. We've got one guy who has a, a, a Linux box and a bunch of us with Macs, and we just we had somebody compiling it on Windows, and then it got as usual, you know, rapid pre-alpha. It got out of date. But yeah, if somebody wants to make it run on Windows, you'll you'll be able to and jump in. Anybody else? Anybody else? Max. Um, maybe to uh, stress test the idea just a little bit, but uh, do you worry that in trying to make something so realistic in that in that sense that um, well, you know, there's not many people sitting up here in the front. In fact, this seat next to me, these seats were vacant for a while. Maybe some people might be uncomfortable with that level of intimacy with basically strangers. Yeah. I mean, I might not be. For, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting up here in the front, but you know, maybe there's other people that that's too much. Or maybe you hit sort of like an uncanny valley of yeah. not enough realism, but the sort of the wrong kind, something like that. <laughs> well, totally. Like trying to cross the uncanny valley for the special case of one-to-one -one interaction in a virtual world is like exactly what we're trying to do and it definitely has it definitely has risks right like like for example trying to trying to trying to poorly animate the the mouth is it, just you know like don't go there right it's only only death you know only bad things are in that direction so uh, that's the kind of stuff that we're worrying about as to the question of like is it too intimate I think that virtual worlds in general offer everybody a kind of a sliding scale on that that the real world happily that or that is a benefit over the real world, right? Like you can be very intimate in a virtual world or, well, hopefully with the work we're doing, you can be a lot more intimate, but uh, uh, you can also choose to use text if you want to. And I, you know, I think that people talking to each other, I mean, look, look, look at the incredible experiences and relationships that people have built in Second Life with each other. I've never, I've never met a single case where people who like met in Second Life never met in the real world and then I, I watched them meet in the real world. Every time I've seen that happen, they really have known each other. There's been no, Oh, I didn't really understand, you know, who you really were. It's, they they always do, and so I think that virtual worlds in general have this, like, they offer this sort of wonderful slow slowness to them, you know, where you can slowly get to know people and slowly get to understand the world, or you can do it really fast. And my my hope, just as a very, you know, as an entrepreneur who just wants to go faster, 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 and see all this stuff more and more amazing, is to just try and get that intimacy level on the other end of the dial up as high as you want it to be. And I mean, that's, then that's what we're trying to take advantage of with, with all this hardware, so. Great, thank you very much. Exciting uh, product. Uh, basically, quick introduction. I'm pretty sure everyone knows what haptics is, yes? Yes, good, yes, awesome. Uh, wonderful. Uh, so basically, it's a handheld device uh, that is simulating uh, the feeling of perhaps holding a sword or swinging a mace or something uh, similar to that. Very, very cool applications for VR. Uh, once you emulate sight, like once you're in the rift and you get used to it and you're like, all right, excellent. The next thing you want to do is see your body and manipulate things in the environment. Uh, that's like the next step. Uh, so haptics is going to be a very big step uh, for the success widespread success of VR, so we're very excited to see a product that's already out there uh, that has a lot of commercial appeal, uh, and from what I've read and seen through video, it seems to work very, very well. People are very impressed uh, with the performance of the product, which is awesome. All right, so looks like we're ready to go. All right, I'm going to pass it over to Will. Let's give him a round of applause. Welcome him up. Thanks for having me here. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to get out in front of you and explain a little bit about, uh, well, today what I want to talk to you about is uh, kind of an overview of how we got to where we are, um, kind of explain a little bit about the technology and then open it up uh, so we can get a little bit of early feedback from you. We'll give some demos and then if you feel comfortable, we have a, a survey that we'd actually like to uh, have you fill up because we're trying to become a little bit better informed leading up to doing a Kickstarter campaign and actually get some of this hardware out there to all y'all. So, uh, but let's start with the first place. Uh, so, um, I kind of have two hats I'm wearing these days. Uh, so I started a company called Tactical Haptics. Uh, it's based out of Utah currently. Um, the research that uh, led to the demos you'll, you'll experience today are, were developed out of my lab at the University of Utah. Um, and so I have contact information for, for both those. And you feel free if you have comments, uh, um, to contact me directly at wil at tacticalhaptics.com. Uh, um, 
And just so everybody's on the same page, I usually, you know, I think we all know what haptics are too, but uh, in case you're ever w wondering why this magical word is out there, it's because it comes from a Greek root, uh, or Greek word that has a root that means to touch. And essentially, uh, the easiest way to explain it is, is we've all been to the eye doctor, um, that's related to optics, so haptics is to touch as optics is to sight, okay? One reason I want to get us on the same page with that is just because um, we're going to be talking a lot about haptics here. So here's our vision of uh, consumer-enabled VR. You know, now we have the Oculus Rift. There's uh, nice devices out there to be able to kind of move around and gesture and measure where you are in space. And so just to be up to date, we have uh, the, the new uh, system, uh, the new uh, development kit that uh, was announced today by the guys at Sixth Sense. And of course, you know, the world buzzes because we all know that that is haptics. That is the definition of haptics that, that the world knows and understands, right? And you feel very comfortable when you reach into a virtual wall that it should just go buzz and I, when I release it, that's, that is haptics, right? You know, like I, I tap on this and it feels like buzz, right? <laughs> So no, it's, it's, no, what we're trying to do is improve upon that and uh, a way to be able to package this in a way that feels better than buzz, um, but that I can make a price that you might be willing to pay, start to look a little bit like this and I'll explain what this is. To get you to the point where you understand how we got here and the genesis of all this stuff, I just kind of wanted to backtrack for about two or three minutes here, we'll come back to this, talk a little bit about this, and we have demos of this device hooked up to a number of different scenarios, whether you're a first person shooter, or whether you like doing melee combat or driving or whatever your, your bag is, I'm sure that there's a, a way to be able to improve the interaction uh, in those environments. Okay. So it all goes back to this little idea I came up with, I don't know, five, six years ago. I, I'm a professor, so I write proposals and trying to get grant money and get tenure and all this great stuff, has the idea that, well, you know, I'm tired of all the clutter in the, in the, the car. Wouldn't it be great if I could just feel a steering wheel, for example, and know which way to turn next? Or be walking along, have my, my hand in my pocket. I got Google Maps hooked up to my phone, so I could get cues non-verbally, uh, non-visually that way. And the idea was, is, and it's kind of a little bit hard to see because uh, it's a little bit of a dim image here, we have the cap from an IBM ThinkPad um, computer, and it's moving around, essentially, in what would be the plane of the keyboard. And, and what we were originally trying to do is just roughly communicate north, south, east, west. Go forward, turn right, go back, etc. Okay. And to give you a sense of how well it works, I'm not going to bore you with all the, the, the great details of this stuff. We ran a four-direction experiment where we moved that little, that little pad around 50 microns, that's two thousandths of an inch uh, for us in, in the US. Uh, to a millimeter, that's 40 thousandths of an inch and ran it from a half millimeter per second up to four millimeters per second. So not a speed demon, but you go from being over 50% accurate with 50 microns, that's again two thousandths of an inch. If you just speed that up, you're already up almost 80% accuracy with this nonverbal visual uh, tactile cue. And if you go through and increase the speed, you're up to 100% is what this is saying. So we knew we were on to kind of something here because this is something that could be miniaturized, that it could be in your pocket, could end up in your cell phone, could end up in game controllers, could be cheap enough for consumer electronics. And we thought of everything in the world to do with this. So this was our first, it was, it's a device called a teapot. It's like iPod-like and that we're going through lists and you get little twinges on your finger every time you would scroll through stuff. Uh, we thought of, geez, we can march people around and give them blind navigation cues and one of the things that we will want to do. And one of the things I'll also say is, is that we're, if we do this on Kickstarter, we will be very open to having, to supporting as many applications as possible. So we will actually have a little game demo scenario of marching somebody around as if they were blind and this would be a device that might be able to go and attach to a standard uh, walking can, right? So if seeing these videos and trying our demos sparks ideas and you're like, oh, but it's not supported, let us know and we'd be happy to try and uh, support your ideas. And that's really what we're trying to do. We're good at hardware, we're good at doing electromechanical integration we want to tap into the creativity that, that uh, this audience, this community has. Okay? We put it on steering wheels. There's a cooler implementation of this, but you'll forgive kind of the, the overall idea here was hook this up to your car GPS navigation system, get right left cues, instead of having Tom Tom talk at you while you're going down the road or having to go look at the center console and going, oh, I just crashed into the car in front of me. <laughs> We've done this in joysticks. 
And we've done this with uh, Xbox style game controllers in the past. And I guess gotta say that, you know, this was good to have tried, but it wasn't the right thing. So this last fall, we spent a lot of time going interacting with people, having them try out this device. And effectively what we found is all the cute little clever things they were gonna do, go through and give you uh, information from your heads up display about bad guy over there. You know, they're like, well, that's interesting, but I really would rather just be part of the game and not be told that bad guy's over there. So we said, okay, well, geez, if you get shot, you could kind of move those little tactors, those little red nubs, and you could kind of get the directionality of that. Well, you have to actually focus on that too. Most of the things that people liked were the experiences that we created. Okay, so that's essentially what we focused on. And that's what kind of transitioned to this next stage. Uh, and apparently that's where my presentation ends. So just hang on a second here. There we go. So effectively, what we start realizing is people are interested in this experience. If you want to have people experience things in the world as if they're real, you could go through and create objects that represent real world, uh, uh, real world interactions. So we effectively went through and take, took that, multiply it by two, and now it's within your grasp. You can start to do some pretty interesting things with that. So what I'm just gonna show here is these, these are these guys put back to back and actually uh, my student Marcus is the, the one that came, out, came up with uh, the core design of, of this that got replicated twice. And effectively what we're able to do is in this particular case we're going through and moving those together and people are very good at feeling like that's a, a translational force or a translational motion. The key kind of comes in for any of us who remember our high school physics here you can also go through and move these two little nubs in opposite directions, and that gives you the sense of a virtual torque. So essentially what we're doing is we're applying essentially the equivalent of a force vector that way and a force vector this way. This is a force couple, and it's a natural torque, and it feels like a torque. You just go, oh, some people involuntarily just move when you go through and do this. So we got into this paradigm of build an experience, have this kind of active object notion. And Building on that, we started going and thinking, can we put this into handles of devices and generalize this? And this is the, the interaction that you're, you guys are gonna feel today in the demos that we have. Again, we can translate things or move them in opposite directions and that creates virtual forces and torques. And then rather than try and fight PowerPoint, what we're just gonna try and do is give you a sense of the types of interactions that you can create with this. to a user's fingertips. So we have versions that attach to onto robotic arms, but we also have a, a version that has uh, a Hydra uh, tracking board in, inside of it. And so you can kind of move around virtual worlds and not have the limitations that you would if you're gonna be attached to a big robotic arm. So this is just suggesting that, you know, this is the same exact video that we just saw there. Just kind of move us forward. So you can start to do pretty cool things. What we're showing up here is that's what's actually happening in the person's hand. They're going through and feeling the sense of presence. When I go and I open the, turn the doorknob, you should feel a spring that you're pulling, you're uh, twisting against. You should, as you move your hand forward and back, you should feel the, the, those forces in your hand. And then we also kind of think of ways to be able to kind of move people around in a three-dimensional space. And we have some ideas for how to use this for upper limb rehab. Okay. And let me just show you quickly this other. And this is how this guy moves. So we have these little sliding bars that move along the length of the handle. And same thing is happening on the person's hand. We're able to go through and create these translational type uh, forces, our, our feelings associated with this. By the way, this, this is the same outtakes that uh, ended up in the Road to VR footage after we went to GDC in, in, in March. Uh, you can do cool things like go and portray the kick of a gun, or you can have the resistance as you're going through and, and swing a sword, uh, stabbing people, you know, all kinds of great fun things. By the way, we originally had some fly fishing stuff that we were working on, but we realized that people at GDC would be more interested in destroying and killing things than they would be in and going and catching fish. But, um, but that's you know back in the works, and you know, people generally like it. That's the the, the great thing is is that you know you hate to go through. It could be as clever as you like, but if nobody responds to it, you kind of just go and write your paper about it and move on just like I used to do in the past. So um, that kind of gives you a sense of where that's going. I had a couple more questions for, for uh, you know, just so I can kind of 
get a sense going forward. So this kind of shows the evolution going from a single one to multiple, kind of build, being able to build into multiple interactions, changing from precision grip to a power grip. And really, the limitation that we have, so we're always, your, the first question I'm gonna get is, have you thought of putting in a glove? And of course the answer is yes. And uh, the biggest limitation of the hardware is you have to, the limitation is you have to be willing to interact with the world with a tool. Well, I hate to say it, that's most of the time. Very rarely do you ever have a bare naked hand doing anything these days, right? You're going through your, uh, I'm gonna dig stuff, I'm gonna use a pencil to write with stuff, I'm gonna you know, have a sword or I'm gonna have a gun or, you know, like, think about anything you do in a gaming environment where you have a naked hand doing anything. Well, even like in the Tuscany demo, you're going and you're picking up things and well, geez, you now start interacting with the world and we can represent those types of interactions. So if you, like, for those, who, who was at GDC and tried out the, the Oculus demo there? Or who has tried it out since then and were, was like, you know, like, oh, geez, this is really awesome. Um, geez, now I got the Razer Hydra, I can reach out and all I want, want to feel things. That's essentially what we're trying to tap into is let you go and touch the world. And there's, of course, some compromise in this because if we were gonna go through and build this all up into the, you know, the, the $10 million device, well, there'd be two of them and you'd have to visit and there'd be a really long line. Instead, I'd rather go for something I can sell initially for you know, under $200 and long-term for under $100 and be able to get into all your hands, okay? So in order to do that, a couple of questions from the get-go. This is kind of, uh, uh, Amir will, will smile when he, uh, when he sees this, but the initial question I need to be able to answer is, can I actually put this on Kickstarter at a price that you're willing to pay and make some compromises to make all this stuff happen? So one of the first things I'm contemplating is, should the, the tracking be integrated? This one, basically we've done a mod, a Razor Hydra and the board from the Razor Hydra is sitting, sitting right here. By the way, it's, I think it's the same location as you guys are putting it in your, your new um, uh, developer kit. Or should we go through and just make it so that, well, you can put your Razor Hydra here or your uh, Sixth Sense uh, developer kit right here or whatever you like. People have a feeling about this? Do you care one way or another? Is it essential to have access to all the buttons that uh, you know and love from uh, the Hydra? I think people might have to try and you know, get some hands on. Probably not a lot of people here have tried this. So this is one of the exact questions that we have in our survey. So main reason to put this up here is to get you thinking about it so that when you try our demo, and then later on, hopefully, you'll spend uh, the 10 minutes to fill out our survey. It's up on SurveyMonkey. Um, it's actually this address. I should have put it at the top of the page. It's goo.gull. Yeah, and it's a easy easy. Um, and it's written down over. We have actually some some printed out ones. If you, well, it's probably for, uh, fortuitous since there's some internet problems here tonight. Um, the, the address is on there, and we're just looking for some feedback from y'all so that we can kind of become better informed and decide what to do. Because I don't want to go through and put stuff out there at a price you guys don't want. Uh, I also don't want to go through and uh, put it at a price that you, you can afford and uh, have to go through and sell 10,000 of them in order to be able to break even and not have a successful Kickstarter because then no one wins either. So I'm trying to get myself calibrated and get some input. Um, the, the nature of the input I want uh, on this one is if you have any ideas after you try our demos of, of stuff that you like to uh, give you other ideas, the things that we should uh, do demos for, great. If uh, you have opinions about this particular question, great. If you have uh, thoughts about what level of support, what platforms, right now this is all, all of our demos are developed in Unity. Is that sufficient? I don't know, is it, do we need to do an Unreal, UDK? Those are the types of questions so that we can go through and present something that's appealing uh, to you all and that you would actually use and it would facilitate your use and productivity, okay? Because essentially, like I said, we're good at going through and doing electromechanical integration and, and making at least lab hardware level. If we go through the endeavor of trying to make over a thousand of these things, it'd be great if someone actually cared. So, um, so I guess at that, th this point, maybe take some questions and uh, if we're running out of time, we can also move on too. So any questions that you all have? By the way, we're, all, we're set up right over there uh, for, so when things calm down and demo start to your Really? One question. All right, come here. Can you do wireless? Can I do? Can you do your controller wireless? Wireless. wireless. Oh yeah, you just put a battery pack on it, and it's all wireless. No, actually, the reason I can't is because we're using a Razer Hydra. No, I'm talking about your 
Haptics can be done wirelessly. There is no workspace limitation. A lot right now. It's, uh, it's over an amp. Uh, we can bring that down basically. Everything's a compromise, right? So that's one of the things that uh, Marcus is working on right now is reducing the amount of power that everything takes. We're trying to get down well under an app if possible. Uh, maybe that's, a, that's another good question that we should have put on there is are you willing to compromise performance for battery life and switch out the batteries every two hours if it's an awesome experience as opposed to we can try and get you 10 hours but it might feel, feel this much better than you know, your pager motor in your phone. <laughs> so. You get a little bit of a free pass right now because the Rift, you know, most people are not using it for long stretches except for second. <laughs> yeah, after about an hour or so, you unless you have uh, superpowers for, for using it for extended periods of time, I think you you pass out after an hour. Uh, right now, everything's just uh, powered from uh, from the wall. Um, so, if I had to take a guess right now, I would say that we're probably at a couple of hours uh, using double A's. Yeah, there's, there's all kinds of technical solutions to be able to go through and make it convenient. Initially, with Kickstarter, we're going to have to cut some corners because... Um, Initially, yeah, Yeah, no, so long term, my goal is to get this down to maybe $75 to $100 with integrated motion tracking. You get two of them, both of them have awesome haptics on them. You know, that's when you're going through and making 100000 to a million of these, and, and then you, you know, the cost of your tooling is insignificant. Right now, we're looking at like $100,000 worth of tooling, and if we sell 1,000, you guess what price gets passed on in each one. So it's $100 and you haven't even passed go. So basically, we're trying to make it so that we can get hardware out there um, and get you guys using it, get feedback. Uh, any experimentation besides hands, like body, feet, or somewhere else? Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, there's been all kinds of research done. Um, people have done vibrotactors on feet. Uh, you can, the answer is yes, you can do this stuff. You should have a, you know, a really targeted application. Palmer was asking me, you know, could we do something like this on feet uh, to simulate walking? And uh, my sense is, the, by the way, the, the, what makes this, this feedback work, and you can try doing this stuff without moving around just to, to see if you believe me is we're tapping into and providing the feedback, the, the friction forces, the shear forces in your hand that you expect when you go through and strike something or you're going through and moving around in the real world. We're not actually physically resisting you, but we're giving you half of the, of the equation. So there's the skin sensation you experience and the physical resistance, and we're at least giving you half of that. And that's the reason why it works so well. If in your, the answer in your case is that if I'm not physically stepping, I don't know that haptic feedback on your feet will be that exciting. So. Nice. I know some people in the um, telemedicine and specifically telesurgery field. And from what I hear, one of the biggest reasons why telesurgery hasn't taken up, well, there's more than one reason. One of the biggest reasons is because they haven't had something like this. Do you see an application like this for something like that field? Yeah, so the, the model for the company that I started is to essentially develop technology to the point where it gets out, create partners, go through, support uh, future development work on SBIRs, uh, small business innovation research grants, and we'll be writing something to uh, National uh, Institutes of Health to be able to go through and do the next generation of, of uh, devices. And that precision grip device is directly targeted towards uh, robotic surgery in a nutshell, yeah. So that's exactly the target for it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think it would be practical at some point in the future to generate enough force to say simulate, you know, a sword bouncing off a shield or something, actually to stop you? So that's the, so we're actually not generating any external forces. There's nothing actually right. forced you. So the interesting thing is it's all skin sen sensation, and what what we find is is that because it's realistic enough, people are actually subconsciously or voluntarily part of the experience of like. They don't, you know, there's just so much resistance, they don't want to push any further. And if you want to, you can just kind of push right through virtual walls just like you used to be able to do when they were buzzing. 
but we find that people, as long as they're not sitting there staring at their hand all the time going, yeah, this doesn't work at all. It doesn't feel at all like I'm hitting a wall. I mean, if you just sit there and stare at your hand the whole time because you really want to be a naysayer, it will feel like nothing to you. I can just tell you that in advance. It's the fact that you're like you're engaged and uh, we have our rift up and probably initially we'll just run without the rift, but if you stick around, once the lines go down, we'll fire it up and it gets even better because you're just, you're in there. There's no, you know, you're not even thinking about what's in your hand. You're thinking about what you're smashing with your hand, right? Um, so I don't know if I answered your question, but we're not generating any forces. It's really, you are becoming such a willing participant in the whole experience that you are resisting the, the, the urge to go through and just keep on pushing into the virtual wall and saying, well, this isn't realistic at all because I'm two feet into the wall right now. I'm feeling just the same thing as when I just made contact. For so the idea is, is that initially when people are, say, post-stroke, for example, really it's range of motion and they're not even providing physical resistance at that point. It's really just get them moving around so that you could go and give them cues to, while they're moving or the sensation of resistance but with no real physical resistance. There's some advantages to this because it could be inexpensive. You could do this at home. Right? And the other thing I actually didn't mention at all is, is that because we're not actually applying any external forces, it's also inherently safe for applications like robotic surgery where, you know, if you had a poor estimate of forces, it could kind of jerk your hand out of the way. It's never going to go through and provide these, these types of forces interactions that are going to hurt anybody. It's another nice, nice thing. But initially, it's just get them moving through some space. And also the other benefit is, is that if you can go through and tie more systems into the rehabilitation process, getting tactile along with kinesthetic, there's probably going to be some benefits to go along with that too. And we're starting to find partners uh, in our rehab center in Utah for looking at that closer. So it looks like the amount of motion So continuous motion in one particular direction or another. Y you can do stuff like that. It turns out that there's, um, so for everything you, you, you come up with, we, we've probably tried it. So the, big, the biggest disadvantage with doing something continuous like that is you have a greater potential to pinch. And in fact, Marcus spent a lot of time with the design of this to go and flare the stuff out at the end. So there's really no possibility of ever really pinching anyone. You'd have to try and really force some loose skin into that gap to, to get a pinch. Um, so I'm not trying to give you any ideas of how, how you can go and, and get a lawsuit going, but uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's really kind of difficult uh, to go through and design something that rotates continuously to be able to do this stuff. And a lot of people have asked me the same thing. Did you find that the amount of simulation? Like for a gunshot, this would be sufficient. Maybe a sword dragon, but like if I'm holding a rope, I'm holding a sword dragon, 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 uh, right, and so uh, again, the reason it works so well with the way that we're doing it right now is because when you're actually physically moving around in space, you can supplement. So you're getting vibrations, you're getting skin stretch, you're also getting uh, external resistance. It turns out that uh, as long as you get enough of those right while you're physically moving, you don't have to get them all right. And so what we're doing is good enough, I guess is what it really kind of comes down to. It becomes more complex and then it starts to become this cost performance trade off of I could do that, but now will you be willing to pay this extra amount? And I, well, am I willing to take on the risk of I'll pinch your hand and turn off some people and, uh, and making a device that hurt somebody? And then they blog about it and then they're like, oh, yeah, tactical haptics pinched my hand. You know, like. <laughs> yeah, so. All right. Anyways. Um, so, so I think that's uh, any more questions we can take offline while we're over here. We'll keep things brief. Awesome. Is that awesome? Uh, but I'm not a developer. I'm not. I'm just a, a guy who studied political science for a few years and decided I don't want to be a part of this. I want to be a part of this community that you guys are building and putting together. So what I've decided to put together is a, a, a podcast. Uh, it's called Enter VR. And what I'm trying to do is just, I'm just trying to have conversations with you guys. Whatever you're doing with Oculus or peripherals, hardware, software, I want to know. And I want to get you guys uh, some exposure uh, because this is... I think is the future, and what we're doing here is recording a little bit of history. So I'll be around, come hit me up. Uh, I just wanna, we can Skype, and I'm available whenever you guys want. Thank you.
see some, uh, some channels of communication open up there. It's exciting, Chris. Very good, very good. Um, David, I think? Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, so we're Team Scryer, and we're working on a project with uh, connecting uh, video imagery and still imagery to the Rift. Uh, and we're doing it in WebGL. So if you guys are using any of the technologies, we're going to check out what we're doing. We're over here. So, thanks. video technology, so if you want to come check it out, we've got some stereo GoPro footage in the, in the rift if you want to check it out, so come on by. Um, so we will have some demo stations set up uh, around the way. We have Six Cents and the gang. Please ask more awesome questions to them. Um, I have a set up here with a racing wheel and a rift and a variety of random demos. Um, so we can try some stuff there. That's no good. Exactly. Is this a, let's see. And we kind of got a paper bag, man. I don't know. kind of getting some impressions from Bruce here. Uh, so we have our classic uh, shooting gallery sword and, and flail demos and just kind of wanted to get your impressions of these things. So here, here we have uh, the shooting gallery. Absolutely. So we have, uh, let's, let's, let's uh, recalibrate here. Yeah, that's probably perfect. Right. Excellent, that's feeling great. Yeah. Um, so we got my aim here, boom. And just like pulling the trigger, it's like, I heard the explanation. And I know that's just friction against my skin in, the, in my hand, um, but my brain is telling me I'm getting a, a physical kick from this gun, which is really, it's just really wild. Um, it's, uh, it's a really, really awesome feeling. Uh, oh God. Oh wow, I wasn't ready for this. Awesome. <laughs> Excellent. And then we got the, the sword. Yeah, so switch the sword. That's awesome. Um, let's do a little parry here. Uh, yes, so do a little chop. That's that feeling right there. Like when I get under arm and I'm just like, 
I'm feeling the resistance of the sword against the arm here, which is just, it's just crazy. It's like, again, I, I understand this, the explanation of what's going on, and I can, if I look at it, I can actually see what's going on. Um, that's only friction against the skin, but as far as my brain is concerned, if I'm concentrating on what, what I'm doing here on the screen, is that I am getting physical resistance from trying to lift something with the edge of this sword. Um, which is a really great feeling. I can only imagine, like, once you're in here with the rift and you're swinging a sword around, um, that you are pretty much entirely cool, which yeah. is just amazing. And then, um, and then here we have the flail. Excellent. So we're looking at the flail, and uh, this is one of my favorites already. <laughs> so just, you know, just a really natural motion, exactly as I expect. And I'm already, like, swinging this around, and it is just... I mean, the only indication that it's... That is not actual, just some kind of physical kickback of motion is that I'm hearing the noise. Like if I was blasting some medieval music, I wouldn't know any better. Like as far as I'm concerned, I'm holding a, yeah, we have a the, giant ball of metal. Like, we like, have the Bose like, headphones that we were going we to crank out, but we're like, no, that's no, that's cheating. Oh, it was so yes. much noisier in here before you didn't even hear it. Exactly. So. <laughs> See, like when, if, if I don't hear that, so like uh, to remind me that, oh, this, this is just friction going on. I mean, dude, this is like, and just like swinging it different ways. It's like, it just feels, it feels right. And I mean, not just like when it gets going does it feel right, but I slow down and the ball swinging back and forth. I'm feeling very delicate, very soft motions, uh, depending on where this, where it is, on the right, on the left, and I'm feeling, it feels right. I'm feeling the right corresponding, like, um, weight there. So the only thing that's like, if I'm just holding it, even if, if that, like, motion, I'm not, Getting too much, but as soon as I move a little bit, I'm getting something, which is um, that is a, that's very impressive to be able to get that level of interaction with just uh, any type of motion I do, not just the expected. Oh, I'm doing a flail, but when I get it wrong, it's all over the place. I'm also feeling the consequences of that too, which is really awesome. Bruce, um, so can you describe kind of what you're feeling when you're like trying to describe it? I can try to describe it because it's it's. Uh, it's, it's kind of rough because, okay, I can describe it two ways. The first way is if I'm just closing my eyes and I'm swinging this, it feels like there's something on the end of what I'm holding. Um, it may not be as heavy as a huge mace, but there's definitely something there. Uh, if I can look at this and I can hear the noise, I can tell, okay, these things are moving and I, I don't have anything here. Um, so it's kind of breaking the illusion if you do that, which is... Uh, you know, why would you want to do that? You know, it's like, yeah, you, I mean, you totally can, of course, but I mean, once you concentrate on the experience, um, you, you are getting significantly fooled, which is very, very exciting. So, yeah, I'm feeling the resistance in my hand uh, and against my skin as if I have, you know, an object in my hand. It's just like the resistance that you would expect when you have the handle of a mace and if you're holding it, and it's, uh, you know, it's slightly moving up and down or side to side as a result of the emotion that you're making with it. That's the kind of feedback that you're getting here. Um, that really detailed and slight friction that you're going to be getting from the object that's actually in your hand. Um, and it's impressive. Yeah, and you tried the, our other demos, the new slingshots and uh, mm -hmm. the driving demo on the Oculus. What did you think of that once you had that level of immersion? Uh, the driving demo was really interesting. That was one when it had the feedback from the wheels in the car on the left hand, and I was controlling the uh, like a turning joystick with the, uh, with the right. And that was pretty interesting, even going on the bumps or going over different terrain and really feeling uh, the feedback in the hand. It's a really interesting type of feedback, um, kind of similar to a force feedback wheel, but a little more intense, which is really cool. Uh, the slingshot is my personal favorite along with the mace. Um, that was one when we had two uh, of the uh, haptic, uh, tactical haptics sticks. Um, and you have one that you're holding and you have one when you put a ball in and you can stretch it back. And the thing was, when you stretch back and then Put it, put the uh, the ball back so like the the tension releases. You can feel that in the controller, which is impressive. I spent about two minutes just going like like this, <laughs> like to just to feel it to test it out, you know. And, and it's um, and it's also corresponding to direction too. So it doesn't just feel the same if you just do this, this, and this. 
if you pull back, you pull to the right, you pull to the left, and you feel something different, and that's really, really cool. Um, and By then, the way, mm -hmm. you didn't try an old thing, but we actually have two-handed sword stuff now. It's not split screen, but you can kind of go like this and beat up the mannequin, and then chain together. Oh, you want to try that real quick? Yes, I do, of okay. course. We, we totally got to try that. So let's do it. Awesome. So can we go to uh, swords? Yeah. That is epic. There you go. And you can oh. actually touch the two swords against each other. Oh my god. <laughs> That's crazy. And of course you can you can do the the Spartacus decapitation. Exactly. Move. Like, it's a little hard to coordinate, but it is, it is like alright, here we go. Gladiator. Practice gladiator style. <laughs> oh, okay, just trying to get my bearing. There we go. Yeah. Oh, oh no. There we go. There we go. Oh, ha! oh that would have been a pretty good strike. Yeah. Wow. Well, the original idea was to have like uh, Monty Python things going, hey, it's just a flesh wound. Come yeah. back and have limbs popping off. That would be hilarious. That would be hilarious. It's just a flesh wound. So let's, let's um, go and put the wrist back on. And your throttle hand. But this isn't to uh, recreate the sword thing, right? This is just to show. Oh, this, right. is, this is just basically. Nice. Turn it down just a little bit so I can hear you guys. <laughs> that better? But with the noise canceling Excellent. headphones, you can. You're not thinking about the haptics at all. I mean. Ooh. Oh, now I'm getting feedback in both, which is cool. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> oh, that is wild. Now this is even more solid, Fe having the feedback in both hands. I can feel acceleration. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, here. <laughs> here we go. You can do the loop. Let's do it. So on screen, he's got a little loop right here. Oh! <laughs> Made it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> So we have a little Excellent. bit of terrain here on the left. Excellent. So I have some terrain over. here. Oh, uh, here we go. So I'm feeling like the whole the suspension, I'm feeling it in my palms, which is really very, very interesting. And it's a, it's a, another level of immersion because it's like it's another way of connecting me to the game. Although that's not something you normally feel the suspension in. Like if you had a steering wheel, I guess you'd feel a little bit, but it's still like. It's a really interesting feeling to be able to have that that correspondence to the in-game world that way. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. Feeling yeah, that like is really cool. awesome. I'm gonna recalibrate. Well, um, like that's pretty good. I'm getting both, and that shot's pretty good too. Oh, it's awesome. Yeah. All right. So one of my favorite things here, we have our slingshot, and it's just empty. It's just hanging on, and I have a ball that I can place into the pod. I hold the trigger, and now that ball is in my slingshot. Now, what is really cool is I'm feeling resistance in both hands, and that resistance is not uniform. So if I have it just like this, it's cool, it's slack. I get it back, and I'm feeling resistance to the right is different than to the left. Now I'm feeling a totally different type of resistance there. To the fact, oh, to the point where I don't want to go too far that way. Like, it feels like my hands are going to get fatigued, or I'm, I'm, it's going to be, like, I can't go farther. I guess, I mean, I could force it, but... Like, this is definitely contributing a lot to fool my brain that I have this object in front of me that's floating. Oh, crap, the sound is awesome. All right. Ooh, love that snap. It's so fantastic. Really cool to get that feedback. Uh, yeah. So this is like, uh, I can imagine this like in a high pressure game, this really making a difference because you're going to have these little micro motions that probably interfere. Like if you had a slingshot like this in game or like our archery game when the, the resistance really matters, like uh, it might actually, I don't know if it's going to increase the skill curve or maybe even decrease it because you'll be able to feel the sweet spot actually. So if you can feel the sweet spot and you can get it every time, then it might uh, increase things for you, which is kind of cool. Like that! <laughs> which is really very awesome when you add this extra element of 
of touch and this very novel way of manipulating your brain into believing uh, that you're getting a certain amount of resistance and feedback, uh, that adds an, another level of difficulty into uh, the game experience. It, it adds another level of depth uh, to your, your learning curve to that game, which is a really profound thing as well, um, where you're going to have actual real muscle memory on another level. So that's really cool. Uh, awesome. Oh, damn it, I moved my hand. Uh, yes! Awesome. <laughs> Sweet. Epic. So, so thanks for trying it out, Bruce. Awesome. Uh huh. And uh, so, what, what did you think? The, the full experience with the Oculus uh, Rift and the the Bose headphones and Oof. the, the Man. future. That's the future. <laughs> that's what we're that's what we're looking for. We're looking for a complete package. We're looking for a way to intuitively work with the environment and also get some feedback from that virtual environment. And I think that's uh, that's what we're looking for, man. That's the next step. And um, I'm hoping that. Uh, Thanks for trying it out. Yeah, that's you're going to be doing it. Dude, Will, awesome job. Awesome stuff, dude.